housekeeping things. My name is Carol Epp um, and I'd like to welcome you all here. Uh, today Make and Do is hosting the artists in residence from Medelta to give some artist talks um, as part of Clay Week. Clay Week, if you came here through a different channel and not Clay Week, um, is an event that happens once a year in October and it's an international event where um, different organizations, residency programs, universities, independent artists, you name it, basically get together and offer different online content so this year is different than most years in that everything that we're doing is online normally there's an open studio component on the weekend that's actually happens throughout the world in person this year all we are having the open studios but those studi open studios are all happening online so there's still quite a bit happening over the next couple days all the way until Sunday and lots of live events that you can jump in on um, and get to know a lot of amazing artists from around the world. I think some artists are doing studio sales this weekend as well, uh, sort of aligned with their open studios. But basically Clay Week has been put together as a way to bring community together and to foster community, um, expand different ways that we can all outreach to new audiences um, and basically just get together and have fun and talk about craft and clay. So thank you for joining us for this um, and thank you to Medelta for being a part of this. We really appreciate that. So um, just one uh, housekeeping note is, is that we are going to be recording this. Um, we are going to record the entire thing and then we'll be putting it on our YouTube channel because Making Do has a YouTube channel. So if you do not want your face to be in the recording, please do not have your face on your video, um, except for our presenters. They have no choice. Um, and what we're going to do is each artist is going to present um, and after that we're going to have a quick little um, session where you can ask that question questions directly to that artist and then after all of the artists have presented we're actually going to have a bit of a Q&A and open forum about Medelta and the residency program itself so if you have questions about Medelta if you've always wanted to apply you know those kinds of things that's a great time to pose those types of questions so save those for the end and of course if you have a question for one of the artists that you kind of think about after their presentation you're processing we can always come back and bring questions to those artists again at the very end of it all okay um, so just as a quick acknowledgement as well I know we're sort of coming in from all over the world right now um, but I'll just start because I've started this whole thing um, and I'm just going to recognize the fact that I am coming to you from Saskatoon today and I want to recognize the fact that that is Treaty 6 territory, the homeland of the Cree and the Métis nations. Um, I also recognize that it's the traditional homelands of the Lakota, Dakota, Nakota, Dene and Salto and reaffirm the relationship and responsibility commitments that we have made through that treaty. Okay, so I'm going to actually pass it over to Noriko to start. Noriko is the um, Acting Director, Artistic Director. Residency Coordinator is still like official <laughs> title, so yeah. I was close, I didn't have, she's sort of one of those people that does it all. So um, I'm gonna pass it over to her first and maybe you can start by just giving us a little outline of what Medelta is even to begin. Sure, okay. Hello everyone. Um, I didn't have any of the acknowledgements prepared, so I apologize for that. But um, yeah, so Medelta is in Medicine Hat, Alberta. Um, we've been here for about, uh, well, the residency itself has been here for about 20 years, but this building here has been for about 10 years. We're a 24-7 artisan uh, residency, uh, basically all clay. I think it's the only place in Canada that's specifically about clay. So, yeah, and I'm the residency coordinator here. I have my studio here as well. And these artist talks that we're going to be doing today are basically what we do every month or so. It's a short, quick little way for all our artists to get to know one another. Um, because we do a lot of them, we ch try to change them up. So sometimes it's just about a project. It's a, it could be a bio, anything. So I've just done my example of that this time. So we'll start that off. And sorry, I can't see the thing because of the... Uh-oh. Okay. Wait. So, hello. Yeah, so I'm Noriko. Uh, I make tableware and homeware. Uh, I've been slipcast from China. Um, I do throw a little bit of work, but it's mainly slipcast from China lately. Um, with all the things that have been happening this year, I've been really struggling to kind of 
I've been struggling about the purpose of my work, um, but I've come to think of it as sort of self-care, um, self-care for myself and for others. So I'll get into that a little bit more later. Um, as I said, I'm the residency coordinator of the Medelsha International Artists in Residence Program. Uh, there are our current residents uh, right now. We just took that a couple days ago. Um, this building that we're in was actually one of their uh, newest, I guess, factories. So I know the building, there's slip tanks and everything. Um, this whole site is um, a historic site. The only site in Canada that's considered historic clay district. They actually had to make a spe specific thing for that. Uh, ceramics for tables are not really, it's just my second career actually. This is what I was doing before, ceramics in the mouth. Um, I, I always think about this because, or kind of bring this in because it parallels what I do in pots quite a lot. Um, it's a balance of function and aesthetics, just like pots. So um, it's just, it was just on a smaller scale, maybe a little bit more um, uh, important in some ways because you don't harm people necessarily with ceramics on the table. But um, I actually learned most of my ceramics at uh, North Mount Pleasant Art Center in Calgary, uh, taking evening classes. This is the kind of stuff we used to make, brown pots. Uh, that top left raku, um, that is actually something I made in grade three and my instructor raku it for me. So it's one of my, uh, the pieces I've kept all this time. Um, yeah, I really loved throwing. That was my favorite thing to do. But maybe about 10 years ago, I started to get really interested in industrial ceramics. Um, I had seen a retrospective show of Masahiro Mori, uh, who is a Japanese designer, and his ideal was to make good design that was affordable um, so everyone can use it. Uh, I feel like I've gone in a completely different direction now, but that's kind of what I wanted to do um, 10 years ago. And so what I did was, um, rather than going to Japan, which would make sense, I went to England. I went to Stoke-on-Trent uh, in the UK that used to be called the uh, heart of the potteries. It was the center for industrial ceramics. Um, at the time, in its heyday, they had like 4,000 bottle kilns. Apparently, it was... This, the sky was just black all the time. But there's a program there, um, an MA in ceramic design so at Staffordshire University, so I went to take that. Uh, it was a really odd, it was kind of an interesting program. You just got plunked right into industry. And so you had to compete for live briefs with your, your peers, sometimes with your, my instructor, actually. We made a lot of different things that didn't always um, really speak to me. So I think the important thing I learned here was to make things that I'm proud of that is somehow me, but within someone else's rules. And I think that's important to think of when you're making for making pots for people, because um, I, I make them for hopefully people, other people to use as well. Another great thing about the program is that we had work placement. So I worked at Denby for a little bit, um, where I got to go through their archives and sort of make pots um, based on those archival materials. Um, and then Reiko Kaneko was sort of on the other end, rather than a big factory, I got to work with one woman who just, um, she actually outsourced all of the stuff at the time. So she designed and then got everyone else to make the work. But we started doing some glaze tests and things like that. So since Stoke, I've been making, this is how I make work. So I design things on uh, the computer. I go back to making it in plaster. So that top middle one there is um, on the plaster lathe. And then the top right is where I'm carving plaster. I do often do a lot of 3D printing for the, my models now too. Um, mainly the handles because I like the symmetry. I can get better symmetry that way. And so everything's slip cast now. Um, it's funny because I didn't like slip casting at all when I started. I really prefer throwing, but I don't get the look that I want um, with throwing. And a lot of people think, um, a lot of people thought my, my hand-thrown work was machine-made, but I didn't like how hand-made my hand-thrown work looked. So this is, this actually gets what I want. Um, and so that's, that's why I stuck with it. And also I think the pace of it is probably helps me a lot too, because I'm a very slow maker. Um, so 2013, I came to Medelta. Um, it was actually summer when I came, but this was the only good photo I could find. Um, yeah, it was funny. When I was looking at this photo last night, I thought, um, surroundings do really make a 
a difference or do impact my work. I never thought about it, but really this kind of is like what a lot of my work is, just a lot of white in a band somewhere. But um, anyhow, so I was supposed to be here for one year and now it's seven years later. Uh, when I got back to Canada, I couldn't stand the clay bodies here. I felt so bad. No offense to Plainsman, which is just over there, but um, I was so used to using bone china. It was like pure white. It was beautiful. And I couldn't, I struggled. I couldn't find anything I liked here. So I started making my own work or my own clay body. So that's what I stuck with all this time. Um, mainly slip cast, but then that bottom uh, right picture there is some plastic bone china. So I, I do a little bit of that, but it's really not plastic at all. So I don't use it too much. A lot of cracking and weird things happening. So like I said, most of my work is sort of like blank white with some horizontal stripes, my favorite thing. Um, the bottom right picture here is something that I've just started this year. I think I really needed a lot of color this year with all the things that are happening. Um, and also these ones, you can't tell very well from that picture, but they're, they're um, sort of zigzag on the side. So the, the optical illusions you get with the colors I'm really enjoying right now. So I'm heavily, heavily influenced by Japanese culture. My background is in uh, Japanese and also on Japanese food, especially Japanese food and the table, because this is exactly how a Japanese table looks like. It's a lot of tiny little dishes, all different sizes and shapes. And that's kind of how I make, and I, that's how I eat right now as well, often at home. So this is the kind of work I make. Um, it just, just doesn't seem to, to leave really. I don't like big plates. Another thing is baking and sweets. Um, I actually think sometimes all I really do is make for tea and dessert, to be honest. But that's a big part of what um, what I think of when I'm making. So I make a lot of teapots, a lot of things like little small plates for my mom's desserts. So on the on the left and right there are the sweets that my mom makes, and I've been sort of slowly learning to do that. And so I often think about that. And um, this is from Crafted Fish, I think, a couple years ago, this image. But um, with COVID happening this year, I've really started to think, you know, I'm, I, I'm not very political. I don't make political or social work. And I thought, what, you know, what's the purpose of it? And so really struggled about that because really I just make things that I, I think are beautiful and useful. Um, so I thought, is that enough? Um, and I, I think I still do struggle with it, but I've started to think of it as sort of self-care. I make the work for myself as self-care. Like This is what helps me get through the day. But I also want people to, who are using these things to, um, for their, in their routines as a way to look after themselves as well. So I guess I'm trying to think of it that way. I don't know if it's really working. But um, yeah, so that's kind of how I see my work. It's, it's, um, oh, and yeah, um, functional and utilitarian makers, I think we'll all agree. It's like when you make work like this, it's about community and sharing food, sharing conversation. So I think that kind of sense of um, creating moments to enrich our lives, that's what I, I want to do, I think, rather than it's not necessarily about the pieces themselves. And I'm actually an extremely private and introverted person. So I think a lot of my dishes also are kind of key towards um, being alone and sort of recharging on your own. And so that's kind of another way I think of it as self-care. So I am completely aware that my pots, my work, and I won't change the world, but I wish or hope that some of this work can help people recharge so that they can go on to do the more important things in life. Maybe that's how I started to think about my own work. Um, and the last few images were for, um, I had sent in for the uppercase publication, publication's new book, Ceramics. It's part of their Encyclopedia of ins Inspiration, and Carol, you were one of the editors of that, our writers, editors. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm not sure which made the cut, which image made the cut, but this is my favorite, I think. And so that's why I've gone with it. It's sort of quiet. Um, maybe one-on-one -on -one time with someone, my mom's sweets, and yeah, that's just me. So, thank you. Any questions?
Thank you so much, Narika. That was fabulous. I've known your work for quite a while, and yet I still, I don't know that I've seen all those old brown pots before. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the idea of Narika throwing pots to me, I guess, seems yeah. a bit strange. <laughs> I know. I, it's, it's really funny. I enjoy it more than a lot of the things I do, but it's not what I want to get in the end, so, yeah. Yeah. Does anybody have any questions for Enrico? You can either pop them in the chat or if you want to unmute yourself at this point, you're also welcome to do that as well. Hey, am I off the hook? <laughs> well, you're off the hook for now. We'll get you to come back later. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but for now, we'll move on to Amy Duval. Hi. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay. Can everyone see my screen okay? Okay. All right. Um, so my name is Amy Duval. Um, I'm a sculptural and installation-based ceramic artist uh, from North Vancouver, BC. Um, I'm currently living and working in Medicine Hat, Alberta as a studio technician at Medalta. Um, I completed my Bachelor of Fine Arts degree from Kwantlen Polytechnic University in 2017. Um, and then I moved to Toronto to be artist in residence in the ceramic studio at Harborfront Centre for uh, two years I was there. So I was born and raised in North Vancouver. So this was very um, in close proximity to a historical shipyard um, that had preserved this like really huge hull of the ship, which you can see on the left. Um, it had been sliced open so that people could see the internal structure of the ship. And so seeing the internal kind of um, like rusted infrastructure inside this ship um, really influenced me a lot. It became a very important uh, visual cue for me in my artistic practice. Um, seeing all the detritus kind of left behind as well to rust was also something that was very interesting to me. So during my BFA, um, I started sourcing mechanical parts from scrap metal and like various auto yards that I could make plaster molds from and make different kind of impressions in clay with. Um, I was really struck by these kind of, these like really viscerally gutted objects that were machines, but were also very strangely human. And they were kind of left in this really intense frozen moment in time that kind of left behind this trace of trauma and violence. And it was a moment that was like filled with so much movement, but was um, frozen at the same time. So I had recently just been introduced to slip casting and I was really falling in love with this process at the time. So I decided to um, start using this process to kind of start reinterpreting these uh, found mechanical objects into clay. Um, I started squeezing and kind of manipulating these forms to kind of attempt to leave like more human mark um, and kind of make this like mechanized form of a human trauma on these objects. Um, I also did a lot of drawing and painting in my BFA, so I was trying to think of like ways to incorporate that into my practice. Um, so eventually I started assembling all these slip cast components together. Um, I was really working in direct reference to the human body, both in terms of like how all these slip cast pieces kind of came together and also in how I was displaying them. So. I was thinking a lot of um, in situ and kind of like what these objects would tell people who would maybe find them many, many years down the road when people no longer knew what they were. Um, so here I'm starting to combine um, these slip casted mechanical objects to kind of create more like hy hybridized kind of forms. Um, I'm still working a lot here with references to the human body, um, but now I'm starting to kind of like work with more like visuals from nature and like different kinds of um, parts of the human body and seeing how they kind of connect together. Um, so here I'm still, or I'm still kind of just starting to kind of figure out how to incorporate my drawing practice more into my ceramic practice. Um, so my background was primarily in painting and drawing. Um, so basically like, 
that kind of meant my primary mode of display was mounting my work on the wall. So it kind of felt like a natural step for me to eventually just mount my ceramics directly on the wall. And here I kind of start considering them as more like, like a form of three-dimensional drawing. Um, whereas with painting, you're kind of imitating space. But now here I'm starting this transition of working directly in space. Um, so having a collection of like assembled uh, slip cast uh, ceramics kind of allowed me to work at a really large scale. So very similar to the way that I was painting um, before I started working with uh, clay more specifically. Um, working with like such a huge range of uh, different plaster molds kind of allowed me to work quickly and to really accumulate a large volume of objects that I needed um, to kind of sprawl across an installation space. Um, my drawings were coming more and more gestural, very inky and graphic. Um, it was very much a process of adding and subtracting from the wall um, with the marks that I was making kind of in reference to, again, mechanical diagrams, body, um, and also the shadows that my slip cast sculptures were making. Um, I started drawing directly on the wall compared to working on paper before, um, which was a really big transition for me to kind of try and bridge that gap between the wall and the ceramic. Um, I was really trying to step away from working on a two-dimensional surface and trying to work with the three-dimensional space in entirety. Um, so working directly on the wall, um, I started using colored slips as my drawing medium. Uh, so this made a lot of space for me to kind of use uh, clay as a drawing material to kind of communicate more ideas of like rust, decay, um, residual waste um, from kind of the different industrial sites that I was, had been observing throughout my BFA. Um, and I started to combine wheel thrown and extruded forms with my slip casting to kind of diversify the forms that I was using. So with my installation based work, um, I'm really trying to think of ways to activate the space and try and fully immerse the viewer in kind of this like fictional environment. It's kind of, kind of suggestive of like an abandoned industrial site where these new kinds of like hybridized forms that are like mechanic and organic are starting to combine together to create new kinds of structures and a new kind of, um, kind of like living, breathing kind of space. Um, so here, this is um, a side project that I've been doing um, during quarantine. So I do a little bit of functional work. So this is kind of um, a time for me to get to play um, with more representational drawings um, on my work, um, which is kind of fun to get to do, um, to have that shift once in a while. Um, so these works I'm planning on selling and um, donating the proceeds to charity. Um, so this work, um, here I'm still working with like a really large collection of sculptural wall mounted objects. Um, I really like working this way because it gives me a lot of freedom to kind of play with composition. Um, so this process of adding and subtracting is something that is really, really present in my work. So placing objects close together, far apart, forming relationships um, with the proximity in which they are placed to one another. Um, so I like to play until the composition really feels like it's like a frozen moment, like of an explosion in time. So this is another body of work that took place at Harbour Front Centre in Toronto. So it's installed in a window vitrine there. Um, it's entitled Diagram, Detritus and Deconstruct. So the diagram kind of as a mode of understanding objects and ideas, detritus as the objects that we kind of leave behind us to kind of tell a story. And deconstructing kind of a way of pulling apart complex things and systems to kind of understand them. So, these are things I'm constantly revisiting in my work. So this is another body of work that was installed at Harbour Front Centre and it was split between um, three separate window vitrines. So this is two out of the three vitrines um, sandwiched together in, an, um, in one image. So this is paradox, draft and burst. Um, so I'm really interested in these kinds of ideas of like kind of like self-contradictory statements kind of present in the work and sketching and drafting and this like really explosive moment in time and how all these things kind of come together. 
So now that I am at Medelta, I have access to a plaster lathe, um, which is very exciting for me. So I've been moving away from making molds of found objects, um, and now I'm working more on the lathes to create my forms. So they're still very mechanical and precise, I guess, to a certain degree, but it kind of leaves a little bit more room for ambiguity and kind of fictional like storytelling with these objects. Um, so slip casting is basically, I'd say, like the foundation of my practice. Um, I work in a lot of different ways, but ultimately slip casting is kind of what I always come back to. Um, it's a really fun way for me to create like a really wide vocabulary of forms that kind of makes space for me to kind of like cut and shape and assemble everything in like an infinite amount of combinations. Um, and then kind of combining them with like hand build, wheel thrown and extruded forms as well, kind of just like creates this endless amount of possibility with all these forms, which I find really exciting. Um, so these are some process shots of the studio that I'm currently working in right now at Medalta. So I use tape um, typically on the wall to kind of start drafting out um, this harder line that's present in my drawing. So I always start with my drawing um, first. I'm typically kind of doing both things at the same time I'm drawing and working on my um, sculptures at the same time and they kind of inform each other. Um, but I start off by taping directly on the wall and then the really inky gestural clay drawing goes on top. Um, and then I just fill in this negative space that's left by the tape with a really bright color. So it kind of changes depending on basically what mood I'm, look I'm in or what I've been looking at and researching recently. Um, so that colored line can change quite a bit, but I use it as a tool to kind of draw the eye around um, the installation and then also kind of as a way to kind of attempt to bridge that what I perceive as kind of a gap between the wall and the drawing and the ceramic itself. Um, so working at Medalta has really allowed me to like push forward with my work in a lot of new ways that I, I wasn't really able to do before. So having access to this wall constantly, I can constantly revisit it and kind of re compose my work in different ways, which I think is really exciting for me to get to do. And ultimately I see my work as a diagram, so kind of a collection of paradoxes that explore ideas of like chaos and control and kind of I want it to act as like a metaphor for the human experience and all of its beauty and messiness and chaos essentially and trying to provide a little bit of order and understanding to it all. So that's me and my work. Thanks, Amy. Does anybody have any questions for Amy? Anybody who wants to unmute? Kevin Morris says, hey, thank Amy, thanks. I'm sure you have seen his work, but if not, you should check out Clint Newfeld's ceramics. I have seen his work, yes. I actually took a workshop with oh. him, um, actually at Matalta back in, when was that, Noriko? Probably 2017, 2016. Uh, yeah, I think it was 2016. Yeah, yeah. So I was actually like, I was fangirling so hard over him and his work. So when he was doing a workshop of adults, I was like, oh, I have to be there. And yeah, yeah, it was a really good experience. Uh, Amy, yesterday you and I were speaking a bit about your work. Uh, in terms of the, how the object meets the wall, it intersects the wall. Mm -hmm. you, you're saying, if you can you tell me again, uh, your ideas about like uh, sort of breaking that membrane of the wall? Yeah, so I feel like that's something I'm still, I'm trying to sort out with. I like, I feel like I'm gonna explore it for a really long time, but I feel like for me, I want that connection between the the sculptural ceramic mounted on the wall, I want that connection to be kind of more organic. So when you look at the work, it doesn't look like you can see these layers and they're all kind of just mounted on top of each other. I want there to be more of a dialogue and a connection between them. So I've been thinking about that a lot and how to kind of make that connection more fluid I guess in some ways because I really want these forms to look like they're like they're blooming or bursting from the wall like they weren't made by hand and then placed there they yeah. kind of they kind of pushed out of this space into this new 
studio space, I guess, or gallery mm -hmm. space or wherever the work ends up kind of being installed. But yeah, so I've, I've been thinking a lot about so many different ways to do it. So I'm just kind of playing around with that yeah. and then thinking of ways of how I can actually like come out into the space too. Cause I think the thing with, with painting for me, it's like painting is like an imitation of space in so many different ways, but working sculpturally, you work in the space and it kind of influences how people move around those objects too. So I think because I don't paint in the same way I used to, I kind of want my work to come into the space. So I'm not just imitating space. I'm creating and influencing how people move through that space and feel in that space in a different kind of way, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amy, Jenny is asking, have you thought of using 3D printing as a way of generating shapes? I, I have thought of that. I'm very intimidated by 3D printing, to be honest. I, I feel like it's a little bit ironic considering what my work kind of looks like, but I am a little bit technophobic in some ways. I don't feel quite as articulate as I should be probably in those methods. Um, but I have been thinking about it a lot more because I've met a few people in Medicine Hat who have 3D printers. Um, so I just need to learn how to design my forms in the appropriate tool to then give to the people who can 3D print it for me. Yeah, that, just, it, uh, looking at your shapes, they are very simple in that you can do one simple command called a revolve. And the reason okay. I think about 3D printing is that when the printer puts down the plastic or whatever you use, it leaves these beautiful lines, especially if you print them out low yeah. resolution. And so that could just be another way of integrating your, your drawing with um, sort of the line work that gets placed on the forms. And looking at your forms, it's actually a really simple thing to do in 3D printing. So oh, interesting. don't be intimidated. <laughs> okay, that's, yeah, that's, that's good to know. Yeah, I think I've also just, um, I love the plaster lathe so much, like the process, it's just, it's so satisfying. So I don't think I could ever give that up completely, but I'm, yeah, I'm really interested in like combining so many different things and kind of figuring out how they talk to each other or don't talk to each other in certain ways. So yeah, that's a good suggestion, thank you. Sounds like a grant waiting to be written. Yeah, yes, so that's right. typing away. <laughs> All right, let's move on. We can always come back to artists who have already presented to ask questions, but for right now, we're going to move on to Yvonne. Okay. Are you ready, my dear? Yes, I am. Okay, everyone can hear me okay? Okay, so hi everyone. Um, I wanted to start off by saying a thank you for, to everyone who's joining us today. I'm super grateful for your presence. I'm here to share a little bit about myself and my practice. Uh, my name is Yvonne Kustek. I was born and raised in Oakville, Ontario. Uh, I'm first generation Canadian. Both of my parents immigrated uh, from Slovenia to start a better life for themselves here in Canada. And I just recently moved to Medicine Hat, uh, where I'm currently a long-term artist in resident here at Medalta. So I abandoned a career as a graphic designer to attend AU Arts, uh, formerly ACAD in Calgary, Alberta. I completed my BFA in 2011. So I was a sculpture major who was interested in material and process, uh, who was also very fond of mold making. But in third year, I was introduced uh, to clay by a visiting faculty member in the ceramics department. And that really like truly marked the beginning of my love of, of my love affair with clay uh, and this piece here was an honor of my 30th birthday the body has always been at the center of my practice i was originally interested in a more abstracted uh, representation of the female form i was building the figure through layering clay slip casted from molds of vintage housewares and figurines and then covering them in non-traditional materials like this fleshy rubber uh, I really like sort of the drippy bits uh, that naturally occurred while the material was curing that you can see in the close-up photo on the right hand side. So uh, I then became more interested in creating sort of a more recognizable figure that was abstracted by covering the surface. 
Uh, this body of work uh, was based on the characterization of women in history, in story, and in the media. I was working with a variety of materials uh, and techniques at the time, sort of I was draping clay slip uh, over the surface of the body to be representative of flesh, of skin, of sort of this bedazzled couture armor-like covering. So uh, I took a long break from art uh, and then eventually I returned to the studio with a renewed interest in sculpting the body in a more detailed and defined manner. Uh, I was going through this personal renaissance at the same time so I abandoned basically old ways of working and seeing to bring fresh eyes and new perspectives to my practice. And here began my interest in exploring more natural materials and working in a more realistic fashion. So at the same time, I was experiencing this intense desire uh, to connect with nature and the outdoors. Uh, I became completely obsessed with gardening, uh, finally. Uh, I found this amazing transformative space while my hands were in soil and tending plants. So I spent a lot of time outdoors hiking with friends, um, which I'd really mostly only talked about in the past before. I really loved the challenge of forcing myself, uh, my body up these massive mountains and along long rocky trails. Uh, this connection to nature as a space and place for transformation and healing migrated its way into my studio. I wanted to honor the flowers and plants that brought me so much joy by laboriously replicating their layers and details in clay. Uh, this also connected me to a long and rich history of floral work in ceramics. Um, so basically I decided to abandon all other materials to work exclusively with clay. Um, I had taken a clay class at a local community center, uh, which sparked this interest uh, in sculpting in a more traditional figurative way. Uh, I was also starting to think about ways uh, in which I could connect my interest in nature to the surface of the body. I wanted to uh, create this space of transformation uh, where the flora took over the skin uh, and the body essentially became um, this figurative landscape. This piece is the beginning of that transition for me. Uh, at the same time, I was also interested in making functional work, which is something I'd really only dabbled with in the past and only through slip casting. Uh, it was important for me uh, to create vessels that were organic in form and feel. I wanted to take the flowers uh, that I had been hand building on um, the flat tiles and bring them to life on a 3D form. I really wanted them to appear as if they were growing sort of along the surface of the vessel. And I was experimenting with a few different shapes here in my studio. Uh, this was the first bust piece that I built uh, that I wanted to explore covering with Flora. Uh, I definitely took inspiration uh, from the functional pieces, but obviously I had to make it work uh, to cover the surface of the figure. Um, and here I'm continuing to embrace my interest in a more sort of traditional approach to sculpting. Uh, as well at this point, uh, it was becoming more important to me uh, to expose more of the actual body and face of the figure and work in a more unified and subtle palette. So here I pushed the flesh reveal to a whole new level for me personally. Um, I slowly started to connect the idea of everything in my life becoming more clear and defined to my interest in the body being more visible and not completely hidden under the flora. Uh, this was also my first attempt at sculpting hair, which was sort of a more of a hilarious challenge than I thought. Um, but I was really loving um, this deep investigation into the details of the female form. This was the final uh, bust piece in the series, and I really wanted to push myself to create a more expressive and exaggerated pose uh, while leaving almost all of the face exposed. Uh, my interest in flora at this point had expanded into fungi, which is partly an influence uh, from a few good friends, as, as well as this blossoming uh, personal interest in the role of fungi in nature uh, and their beautiful forms alone. And I really wanted to connect that and have it grow out of the body. Ooh, okay, so, so here, I'm at my first ever artist residency at Medalta last fall. Uh, I'm in this beautiful new space of starting to take myself seriously as an artist and wanting to connect to opportunities that will help grow my practice. Um, but I wasn't prepared for the overwhelming sort of transformative nature of that experience uh, through the space itself to the staff and the other artists in residence and really truly sort of reveling in both failure and success. I, I noticed that I completely grew outside of myself. Um, so I started to uh, hand build larger and more elaborate tile pieces. 
I wanted to play around with new types of flora and to see how I could arrange them together. This was a really great space for experimentation and challenging myself. Uh, being in this place without the distraction of the real world allowed me to sort of tap into this incredible energy of ideas and productivity. And these are just a few samples of tile pieces I made. And this is the main reason here uh, for me coming to Medalta. I had planned to build a life-sized figurative piece and cover sort of the majority of the surface with flora and fauna. And sort of obviously uh, everything that I'd been doing up in the studio at that point had led up to this moment. And it was most definitely sort of the challenge of a lifetime for me. Um, as I mostly self-taught in hand building, uh, there was a ton of trial and error and figuring out how to build this piece. But luckily it survived, as you can see in the photo on the right hand side. And so next was working on the top half of the body. Uh, I really truly learned to appreciate the value of failure during this process. Um, I struggle with being in this space of sort of wanting things to work out uh, perfectly the first time, um, but that sort of uh, takes away from the learning that's connected to failure. Um, and I ended up being able to experiment with layering different types of flora uh, onto the surface of the body and then gaining this better understanding of building internal supports. So this is the second uh, bus study that I made during my residency. Um, and here I was able to elaborate more on the flora that was covering the surface of the body. Um, I also introduced the braid into the mix. Uh, the braid is referencing hair. Uh, I wanted to play with the idea of it working its way sort of down around the body from the head, sort of feeling like it's squeezing the figure. Um, the snakes are a nod to the, need, the Eve narrative um, woman sort of blatantly displaying that she's uh, willingly accepting the gift of knowledge. And uh, speaking of knowledge, one of my favorite aspects of the residency experience is the sharing of knowledge with the other sort of artists in the, in the studio. Um, people who work with clay, I find to be the most generous folk that I know. Um, I discovered China paint by accident through another artist um, when I was having trouble with some of my underglazes. Um, uh, the, burning away in the kiln, firing, and I don't think I would ever would have discovered that on my own, um, if not for being at Medalta. Uh, this is the top half of the figure completed. So she's covered in an array of flora and snakes uh, with parts of her arms, um, stomach, back, and then face left exposed. I really wanted her posed um, as if she's offering herself. Um, there's this sort of sense of tranquil acceptance um, she freely gives herself uh, and her body to this transformative experience. And she's been gifted with this crown of morels um, and chrysanthemums in honor of her sacrifice. So, and I wanted to end off here uh, with a couple of images of what I'm working towards uh, during my uh, year here at Medalta. Um, I was struck one day uh, while eating lunch in the kitchen uh, by the flowers on the table that were slowly fading away. Uh, they were in this perfect balance of life and death. And I really want to try to capture that moment in clay and reflect on the beauty of life and the body as it slowly fades away. And that is it. Thank you for listening, everyone. <clears throat> Thank you so much for that. Does anybody have any questions? I know I have a couple. Oh, there's a fly in my hair. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll start with a question since there's none popping up there right now. Um, do you see your work as self-portraiture as well as sort of leading to different narratives like a, you've mentioned about Eve or different women throughout mythology, but is, it sounds like how when you're speaking that it also seems like it's very much self-portraiture. Am I wrong? No, almost definitely. I've thought about that a lot um, in terms of like the different bodies of work. Um, I can make connections to a lot of things, but there's definitely always sort of this personal uh, I guess reference that goes along with the work where whatever transition the pieces are going through seems to definitely be connected to what I'm experiencing um, at the same time. Yes. And I do have one other question just out of total personal curiosity. Yeah. When you said you said there was one visiting artist that like totally switched you over to ceramics, who was it? Terry Frame. Oh wow, awesome. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll give you like sort of a specific example of one of the, or one example of the many great conversations that we had. Um, I remember I was struggling at one point with figuring out how to glaze the pieces, which is what led me to trying the rubber as a, as a finishing material. Um, and at the time, sort of I under, I had this understanding of clay as being this very step-by-step -step process. Like you make, you fire, and then you glaze. Um, but 
at that time, I, I didn't have an interest in glaze um, because in particular of what I was doing in my sculptural practice. So I was really sort of unsure of how to finish these pieces. And uh, in a studio meeting one day, she just looked at me and said, well, why do you need to glaze them? And it floored me because I, I was just like, well, you do, you have to, there's <laughs> glaze them. And so um, that moment, you know, shifted completely for me in this idea of working with non-traditional materials with uh, the clay pieces specifically, and that was groundbreaking at the time. So I'm very thankful for that opportunity to have had that class with Terry Frame. Do you think you would ever go back to some of that then? Because it's it's like you've moved away and now you're using the china paint and the glazes and stuff mm. really successfully, but do you feel like you would ever come back to reincorporating some non-traditional materials? You know, I've thought about it. Um, I did, I did sort of, uh, over the summer, I, I've had sort of this collection of like resins um, and rubbers sort of like sitting in my studio that were basically collecting dust for a long time. And then one day uh, I randomly thought about experimenting with the material again. Um, and so I think I've, I haven't completely closed that door because I know that moving forward, some of the, um, the fauna specifically that I want to work with in uh, the body of work that I will um, make over the next year would I think it would really lend visually to some of those components so um, I'm, I'm definitely open to trying to you know experimenting with bringing that back um, into the pieces if it works nicely. Awesome really successful work thanks so much for sharing. Thank you very much. Awesome all right well let's keep moving along then next we've got I don't know if, if you go by JC or Julie Claude whichever <laughs> one you preferred. Well, probably like a little bit of both. I don't mind, but uh, I like both, so. Yeah, I feel like GC is cool, so. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Hello. Okay, I'm gonna do this screen, share, power quit, share, and, oops, okay. So, like, hi everyone, uh, my name is Julie Claude Vesukoto. So, I'm a, a recent graduate from Concordia uh, University, and uh, I just really wanted to go back in the studio and just pr produce as much as possible. So, I came back here in Mid Alta because uh, last summer I was part of the production team. And uh, maybe you can see it, but I did like a little um, illustration about it because I do illustration. So like I will tell you a little bit about my background. So when I started university in my head, uh, cartoon were not art and not really stupid, but when at first I was really interested in like installation and uh, with thread, with a lot of like textile work, work. and also uh, I was also really interested in like uh, Quebec, uh, my personal history and my Quebec heritage and I was like, oh, and uh, my um, grandfather had a maple syrup farm so I was like really into those idea and I started playing with clay too and just the form of clay and the shape of clay and while I was playing with all those different idea uh, I was uh, living one hour and a half away from school so when I was in the bus I used to draw a lot because you know it's three hours a day that you're in a bus and you have nothing to do so I, I just start to doodle a lot and kind of like became a way to for me to just um, escape the stress of my daily life. And uh, at a point I did this project and, uh, and it really became a way for me to, to yeah, to just, um, to, to kind of, um, Kind of like it was for me it was kind of a groundbreaking because in my head i was like no i cannot use cartonality and at a point i was like no but it is a part of me and i wanted to show it so i started doing uh these performances where i would start to create those live characters so that was the first one that i did that is called the moi and the and eux and this one is a little bit long so i will trim the video and go back to it. So yeah, and I did after that another one with like expectation and uh, a reaction and reaction. And um, it really became a way for me to just communicate with it. And of course, um, just that way of myself interpreting a cartoon kind of like started to also show up uh, in my uh, ceramic work too. So 
and also became a way of like self-healing also and just feel better. So this work is like, uh, called The Last Supper. And at this point too, I was, I started with the maple, uh, like sugar, well, maple syrup time. And I was started to become really like interested in object in general and what an object can tell about us our daily life. Because I believe that object around us really inform us about who we are as an individual. It can be on a political, personal uh, level. And I was really interested in the intimacy that we have with object. And, um, and, uh, so, and I also I became obsessed with a box of crackers that I had because I realized that I had a sense of nostalgia towards crackers. And if I felt unhappy, I would eat crackers. And I was like, why do I feel that way? So I kind of started to create a series about just crackers and use cartoonality to kind of just um, express how I felt about it. And what I enjoy about cartoon in a way is that you can exaggerate, you know, how you feel and can also speak about, you know, like kind of like harsh subject, but always in like funny way. And, you know, and it's kind of like, I feel it's a, a, a good way to kind of like start a dialogue. And uh, in that project, I also started playing with glaze, which was a word that I never, well, a world that I never explored before. And I kind of also kind of like started to create that crusty feeling. And I was like, wow, glaze are not just glossy with all of you know, but, and uh, you can also like kind of like start to play with composants. So you're like, oh, I will add a bit of silica or I will add like, oh no, less silica. And like, so you can like understand, understanding how glaze work. So once I did um, that project, my next year, actually during the summer, I worked at Medalta and I started do, doing a lot of slip casting. And I was like, wow, a new thing, slip casting. And I started to do mold making too. And and um, I wanted to um, start, start to um, mix uh, hand building and slip casting and created those uh, such, let's such series. So such is slurpy in English. And I uh, kind of like create those characters that, um, again, like slurpy was a thing for me that I was like, why am I so attached to it? Because of childhood, because of nostalgia, but especially, especially with like some brand. And I thought it was really I don't know, I had to, to work it through, and again with ceramic. And I also, um, at that point, was also uh, did like a lot of glaze research and how I started uh, working with, um, with, with, with the Slurpee idea was because um, there was a glaze that I found and it was the perfect glaze, you know, and I tried to recreate it. And uh, 100 tests before, I didn't, when I wasn't able to recreate it. And, but I found like all those other glazes and I found one that was pretty close and I was just like, and while I was tasting stuff, I kind of like create, I, I found that really kind of like rose textured and I was like, oh, that's even more perfect. So I feel it's kind of um, a way that, uh, Ceramic, I, I feel is wonderful. It's like all those little like uh, happy mistake or kind of like that search of something and you find so many other things and you feel a bit like a alchemist in the lab in some way, just creating stuff. And uh, that project because of COVID was put on hold. So it was kind of like my way of that perfect way of showing this project. And while I was working on this project, I was also making a comic book about, uh, about Slurpee. Yeah, and uh, that book, yeah, <laughs> so my drawing practice also really inform uh, my ceramic practice. So it's always kind of like a back and forward. And while I was um, drawing, like, uh, like drawing on this book, I became the way that I actually put the glaze on. Uh, on my pieces uh, was informed by, uh, by the, you know, the, the mark and the mark making and that kind of dialogue that you have in uh, image uh, making. And that project also sparked another project, and, uh, which is a bit different. And in that project, I recreated um, 
uh, the eight page of the comic in ceramic. And I was really curious about how ceramic could actually uh, change the way that you see a narrative and the image and what can it add to it. And uh, so I started to kind of just like, uh, re like um, use Xerox technique and screen printing, as you can see in the back, or I don't know, and kind of like really start to get involved in like all, you know, all the richness of like the technique that you could use with clay and what can it add to actually a story that you, you try to tell. And it kind of like become those uh, really like abstract narrative, but you could still see uh, some part of the original narrative, which I found was really fun because afterward uh, I felt it kind of like became a space uh, to, uh, to project your own psyche. So, and this is a, an example of that. So, and I find it was kind of like that good medium that kind of like went back to my actual love of abstraction at the beginning and also my love of just cartoonality and kind of like mix that two together and also uh, my love of just uh, the, the, the quality of ceramic and what can it, it add to a dialogue. And this project also became like the spark of uh, my project this year at Medalta uh, that, that I, I'm experimenting. And this is actually like a digital collage I did, so it's not it's not real, or maybe it will become real, because again, because of COVID, that project was put on hold, but I really wanted to try to create that 3D form with that beautiful surface. Well, I found you beautiful, and I created, and I, and kind of like create those sculpture that again, like I'm really interested also in the involvement of the viewer in the piece, and I was like, it could, you know, walk around it and kind of like, um, yeah, and kind of like became involved in the piece in multiple ways. So uh, I decided to uh, use a second comic that I made, which is a 20 page comic uh, about uh, like socks, you know? And like it, it was a kind of like the projection of like a, a bad relationship that I had, you know? And kind of like going through that. So I was like, let's do it with suck. And what happened to a lost suck, you know? And, uh, and yes, yeah, so I'm really excited this year about just exploring um, this project, this comic that I made, and also using a different uh, technique. And also the digital part too, because, oh yeah, the suck become a feed too, because you go into the... La Lavers, the washing machine, and like what happened to it. I was like, become a fate. And we became an individual. Anyway, so <laughs> I was really prompt to just make that project into like those uh, large form, form uh, sculpture using the studio space here at Medalta because we have those large scale that we can, we can do uh, really fun stuff here. And also beside it, also started uh, making pot hair and like um, and mugs and stuff like that, which I didn't do earlier with my practice because I'm from a sculptural background. So again, with faces and cartoonality because it sparked happiness in me. So yeah, so I make uh, also funny, funny little play plater and mugs and, and stuff like that. So this is this is what yeah. Thank you so much. I feel like I'm <laughs> like smiling so hard right now. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> That's making me happy. <laughs> I, I have a question. I mean, again, nobody's popping questions into the chat. So you're going to be stuck with my questions if everybody oh. else is being quiet. Um, I really, I mean, I really like how you're taking something that these really beautiful graphic cartoons um, and rather than just taking them and sort of like copy paste onto mm -hmm. ceramics which I mean like mm -hmm. I'm somebody who does that right and like lots of us do that where we just sort of transpose 2d onto 3d you're really mm -hmm. breaking them down and using that clay material and process to really speak and and abstract them and I, I, I really find that quite interesting and quite compelling I guess that wasn't a question mm -hmm. at all but a <laughs> comment. Yeah. Um, but I did have a question sort of going back I mean you see you use this cartoon and humor and then there's this underlying um there's underlying narratives that are, are far more difficult subject matter. And I'm, I'm curious mm -hmm. about how your audience responds to that. Do you find that they get past the sort of the smiles and the, and the laughter to actually delve into that subject matter? Because it's, you, your work is quite rich within with that, that other narrative about the human condition. 
Mm -hmm. But I think, actually, I feel I cannot speak for another human being in some way. I cannot speak and I don't feel like um, anybody that look at a work would have the same answer and the same response because we all have our different, you know, experience behind us. So I wouldn't be able to speak. But I do feel like um, when you create a work and there is like that intention, you know, behind it. And I, my intention is for, for having this dialogue. And of course, when I showed that work, it was in a gallery or a critique and I was part of it. So I created this dialogue, but I wouldn't be able to say if I wasn't here, if this dialogue would, would still happen, you know? So, yeah, I don't know if it's answer, but I don't have an answer for you. No. <laughs> I just love, I, I find art that, that comes at more serious subject matter through humor and whatnot mm -hmm. is, is a really interesting way of doing it where it, it opens a sort of comfortable door for your audience to deal with that darker subject matter sometimes and it can be quite mm -hmm. successful. So yeah. yeah, awesome. Anybody else got questions? Uh, JC, I was wondering, yeah. um, do you know uh, Brian Wilkerson's work? Mm, you have to. I'll, I'll show you, I'll show you later. I, I think okay. he might like, um, like his cups and mugs. Like he, he does a lot of really like graphic faces and he has, I think like a series of work called ghouls or something. And they're like, they just kind of remind me of your work a little bit. Like they're very expressive. They're very much like each piece is its own like character and has like so much personality Ooh. loaded into it. And I think that's something that's like, that's really special about your work because it's, it's like what Carol was saying like you're using these especially with the socks and how they kind of transform into these <laughs> feet and <they're> fighting <laughs> each other. like it's it's so like gross in so many ways and horrific, <laughs> but it's also it's so you tell like a very deeply human like you express a very deeply human emotion through mm -hmm. humor and then also just like through the faces and expressions that these socks mm -hmm. and feet have like their eyes are just so like huge <laughs> I'm like I'm so uncomfortable but I'm like empathizing with them so much at the same time so it's a lot of it's a lot of feelings but I think you do that really well and I think that's really cool so thank you but yeah I will uh, I will um, I think actually uh, Jordan just sent me like the link to uh, the artist that you were talking about at the Oh, yeah. So, yeah, I'm so cool. proud to you. Yeah, you might you might like it. I'll see. Yeah. Really cool. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much, JC. All right. Rob Froze is next. Hi, Carol. Hey. And thanks everybody for joining in. I'll just start right in. Um, I'm here at Medalta again after many times hanging out. Um, over a lot of years, but uh, I, I came to Clay, I think through a combination of studies, really good teachers. I had a father, an artist father, many teachers like Jack Sears and Regina Vixikansky and Regina. Uh, Carol, you would know them as well. Can you hear me? Um, I'll just keep talking. Can you hear me over there, Jordan? Yeah, okay, I can't hear. Uh, oh my goodness! Okay, thought I was sharing my screen. Sorry, everybody. That's okay. Can anyone else see his screen, or is it just me? How about that? You got it. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, everybody. Oh, it's all good. I'll just start again with. Um, beginning of this. Got it. Here, yeah, as I was saying, I've been coming uh, to Medalta for many years. Um, uh, 15 years ago, actually, was the first time at the other residency. And um, since then, a lot of times here, this current one. Um, I'm a potter, a sculptor, and now doing more uh, site sensitive installation work. Um, and I'm a sessional instructor at AU Arts as well. Um, I traveled a lot in my 20s, 30s, and a lot of that time uh, ended up being in Japan a lot, and that ended up to be 15 years of working there. And uh, the building on the right there on the screen is the studio of a friend of a couple, Kazuma and Kate, 
a Danish Japanese couple who I worked with for, well, I've known them for a long time, but we worked together for a number of years. And they introduced me to a really vibrant uh, exhibition scene uh, to the point where I had my own studio and I was fully engaged with exhibitions and making year round. Just, it's a beautiful life and it ended up being um, something that's, uh, uh, it still draws me in my, my memories of Japan and plans to go back someday. Uh, it's just become an integrated part of my, of how, why I work with clay and how I, how I make things. So it's an interior of the studio there with green tea bushes. Um, uh, I'm a potter. I make a lot of pots and that uh, the idea of sets, for example, is one thing that changed for me while working in Japan. The idea that um, a table setting is made up of a varied array of shapes and types and surfaces that enhance the serving of food. And Noriko, you alluded to that too, that you talked about that, about table settings and um, as platforms for food became uh, the motivating factor for making pots in Japan. I'm also interested in atmospheric firing and that's mainly why I'm, I'm coming to Japan or in the Delta a lot uh, to use the soda and the salt kilns which have been recently built here rebuilt and these two pieces actually on the screen those are from a soda firing a few years ago part of living near the beach in Japan meant that I could just jump in a little truck rip down to the beach and spend the day kicking things up in the sand um, especially after a typhoon, there would be some really interesting objects, ambiguous objects, um, eroded by the sea, by the wind and the sand. And I found more and more those kinds of things started to influence what I was making in the studio. I, I think of these things as dishes. <laughs> they, they, you know, they're a vessel of some sort, punctured, eroded, they carry the feeling of that type of activity of, of wind and erosion and decay. Um, and they grew into more and more into my practice of uh, uh, making objects for contemplation, whereas, uh, you know, think of dishes as objects for use in contemplation, and these as purely uh, contemplative uh, objects. So these are salt fired. They're about 18 inches long. Um, these pieces are part of a series that uh, I felt more and more, I found myself working through the idea of exercises as a way to warm up to work, as, to, as a way to generate new forms that are unscripted, that have, there's no prior design involved. Um, there's just a, a parameters of say, the same amount of clay, like two kilograms of clay or three kilograms of clay, and from that, that working process generates new ideas. And, and then I you know, can become more and more aware of the things that I've cataloged in my mind through beach walks and forest walks and walking in the prairie. Um, so in 2016, I decided to enroll in a master's program at AU Arts and that with the intention of uh, you know, beginning something new, like trying my best to just clear things away, start from a fresh point. And what that uh, resulted in was work that has uh, as a focus on connecting my work with clay with my musical piano improvisational activities. And I find more and more those those parallels for me are are quite um, they're, they're quite strong and evident, and they find them. I find that in the way I work with clay, in terms of rhythm and tone uh, placement. In this installation, there's uh, elements of clay, wood, paint, and tape. And the, the tape is like a frame, like a notational framing device. I'm intending it to be that um, placement and tone and harmony and syncopation. These are all ideas that I'm thinking about as I'm placing the installation in a, 
a specific gallery space. I also see other things after I've installed these works. I see, see references to tea ceremony and to Ikebana and the Tokonoma, the area of a, of a house in Japan where there's a usually a, a screen painting or a simple vase with flowers. I see these things you know, coming back uh, or coming out on reflection. Um, I'm also working more with wood too, to build using rubber plywood and trying to integrate form, object and support really. So here I'm matching paint to bisque and bisque to me stand sort of represents a potential state like this the state that we think of as pre-glaze but really it's it could be it could go either way it can decay into powder it could be uh it just to me it represents that point of potential um and here's a few these shots show different areas of placement that are specific to each time i set up the exhibitions um, I think of this as like a tuning note, like when you hear a, an orchestra start, that note that you hear, that, that fingering tuning, this is like the invitation to play. And here's one pot um, framed to kind of invite and then present towards um, you know, a full development of all the notes. And pots are notes here. I think of that as uh, groupings, as chords, and then it becomes pure fun to make and let the process become uh, take over and leave things uh, give things a very open-ended uh, direction to suggest music is rather than play it is my intention and i had the experience of i think uh, Jean-Pierre Laroque was a visiting artist at ACAD, at EU Arts, a few years ago. And we had a discussion about my work in an installation. And without uh, talking to him about my ideas about music, he was referring to these things. And I, I just, that conversation with him really led to like a confirmation for me that, yeah, this is, these are about rhythm. And these are about uh, the kinds of things that, that we think about in music. All of these installation shot, uh, pictures show uh, an MFA thesis exhibition in, in Calgary. And this one is called uh, Walking Octave. So think of eight notes of a walk down the beach, a low, a low shelf, but low and close um, connection with the viewer. So as if you're walking down the beach. And digging up things and you don't know what they are but you're intrigued by them and that's the um that's my intention for the work is to work with you know the process becomes the meaning of the piece and more and more i think about that with my dishes as well is that the you know the process of making of deciding how much bear clay to show uh, to give so that the kiln can um, react on that bare clay is um, yeah <laughs> trying to jam a lot into one idea but it's uh, I'm connecting that's what I'm trying to do connect my dishes to um, tactile experience to connect uh, objects as well uh, to create installations that use the vessel, which is very much where my, where my work is based, and to show open-ended uh, possibilities. I think uh, for these pieces, I thought of exercises, just like you would have uh, piano scales to, to build up technical skill. It's like that with clay, where you might you throw pots over and over in this case cylinders a group of cylinders and then a group of uh, cone-shaped objects and then a group of bowls and then from all those raw materials from that uh, uh, activity of making comes 
the final product, uh, something towards the final product. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. <laughs> oh, there was clapping for that one. That's fabulous. <laughs> Strange. I was in a bubble. It was like playing a, in a recital and not knowing, being, being in a lost space. I don't know if everybody who's watching knows that, that most of you are actually in the same building in just different areas of the building. Yeah. So um, we have and that cross. You know, it's really good to be here with the other geology potters. I've got two over here looking at me, Jordan and Lauren. There are chunks of granite around here waiting to be broken up. And uh, there's a whole lot of uh, alchemy, like ge geological references happening. And or just a, that kind of an approach to, to glaze and clay. That's beautiful. So uh, again, there's no questions popping up, so I have to pose questions, but I always have questions, so that's fair. Um, so you talk a lot about, um, you know, like the beaches and, and Japan and these sorts of, these beautiful references that come through in the work. Um, but you and I have grown up in the same area. We're prairie people. Mm -hmm. And I don't have that experience of Japan in my past. And so I actually see a lot of the prairies within your work. Um, can you, do you see that in there at all? Or, I mean, like even just the use of, of white in some of the objects, but then how things catch the light mm -hmm. um, and markings that, I mean, I think there's so many subtleties to snow at different stages of, of thawing and, and, yeah. and ice forming and stuff that the people who aren't around snow don't understand. And I think a lot of that is really evocative in your work as well. There, yeah, a deep connection to that. That's why I think I feel so good living at sea level. I can, when I'm feeling, you know, over, just uh, overwhelmed or stressed, or I would just drive down to the beach and uh, I'd be on the prairie at night, you know. At, at night, those ships on the lights on the horizon are just like farm lights uh, on, the, on the plains. Nice. You and, can see forever. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So there's that connection for me. That that is, I think about that a lot. But also, you know, the things you find on the prairie here, the bleached bones of animals and uh, lichens on rocks and erosion. It, it's these are the same things happening, and it's it's wind and sun and movement. So to me, yeah, there's not much of a, a differentiation between these two areas. And forest, you know, anywhere you walk, you go where you're walking and you're seeing your footsteps and you're tripping or kicking things. And it's pretty much the same experience. Thanks. Yeah. So one other quick question for you too, since music is such an important component to you in your work, I'm just a little curious what you listen to in the studio. What's on, what's on repeat on your playlist? I've got a lot of Keith Jarrett improv piano um google play seems to know what i like so i just hit <laughs> um uh when ckua radio too listed them a lot nice yeah thanks so much rob well thank you no problem all yeah. right we still have one more to get through lyle you are there with us somewhere hi I'm trying to see you in my thing so that I can spotlight you. There you are, my dear. Thanks so much for being patient and going last. <laughs> it's hard, hard to ask to follow, but I'll do my best here. Oh, I know um, you. You're going to do awesome. <laughs> oh, <laughs> thanks. Um, let's see if I can share my screen here without any hiccups. Okay. All right, I'm just going to start. Um, hi everyone, my name is Lael Schmelich. Um, I'm a resident artist here at Medelta. Um, I grew up in Dawson Creek, BC, um, and I included this photo of me as a little girl, um, mostly to sort of honor the little girl who's um, still in there who thinks I'm an artist, you know, she never gave up. But also I make that same uh, sort of, I do that thing with my tongue when I'm concentrating, so I thought that was kind of funny. Um, yeah, 
someone pointed that out to me the other day that I still do that. Um, and then this photo was taken last spring, um, just when I decided to go for a drive in the mountains with my partner and we brought some of my pots. Um, I hope that it's actually flipping through. Um, so my dad is a forester. Uh, and I remember spending a lot of days growing up looking uh, at plants um, out in forest, but also out in our uh, acreage where I was lucky to grow up. Uh, and we did a lot of um, taking photos of plants um, sort of in specific ways so that we could then identify them using books when we got home. Um, I was never quite adept at uh, uh, remembering the Latin names like my dad um, or the common names like my sister. Um, I'm not sure that this is forwarding properly, so I'm just going to do it manually. Um, uh, the result of looking at all of these sort of identification books was that I looked at a lot of line drawings of scientific, scientific illustration. Um, and I think that really influenced me as a child, uh, especially because it seemed like that was drawing that wasn't as intimidating. It was just a line. Um, but it also had this wonderful way of sort of um, bringing all of the variations of a single plant into one sort of, um, I don't want to say perfect plant, but one sort of representation of all of the general plants um, that we could use as um, the plant. Um, I began working at Clay at the age of 14 uh, when I lived in Dawson Creek at the local college. And I eventually ended up at the Alberta Uni University of Arts in Calgary where I graduated this spring. Um, this is my favorite shot from being there, just the all clay all day. It's sort of like still my mantra through life. Um, and then, then on the left here uh, is a picture of Carmen and I. Uh, we were lucky enough to come to Adelta a few years ago and do uh, a workshop with Carol, which was really influential in um, helping me to put myself into the work. Um, while I was at AU Arts, I focused a lot on sort of this botanical illustration that really um, seemed to speak to me. Um, here are some early works from, uh, from the be beginning, middle of my degree, uh, where I was really looking at um, the way that the sort of back, white background of the early scientific illustration um, from the 18-1900s um, was sort of like almost whitewashing the plants and removing them from the environment and how did that uh, change things. Um, the drawings themselves with the botanical illustration, um, something that really appeals to me still is this idea um, that we can sort of classify things and everything has an order and a place uh, and a role to play um, and oftentimes feeling like I'm not sure what my place or role or, you know, um, really what my identity is or means. Um, it, I think I find comfort in sort of that uh, classification and that keeps bringing me back to that style of drawing. Uh, I began playing with layers uh, to develop a balance between uh, sort of quiet and overwhelming surfaces. Um, and that's really just, I think, uh, a reflection of sort of my mind. Um, I find it really difficult to sort of quiet everything that's going on in my mind, especially uh, when the world feels so loud um, and there's a lot going on. And so it gives me sort of a place to distill what's happening um, and to sort of have some sort of agency over the control. Um, the, this image here and the, and the next image are um, a series of jars that I made um, that are highly decorated. Um, this is where I really began to think about layers on the surface of pots rather than it just being one plane, um, seeing how that can exist as multiple planes uh, that aren't necessarily detached from the pot itself. Um, what I'm looking for um, is an object that is complicated enough that the user can experience the object over time rather than it being sort of one single moment that you spend with the pot, you end up sort of looking through and experiencing all of the surfaces um, and it gives you sort of a reason to stop what you're doing and be present in the moment. Uh, I took an atmospheric firing class um, over a year ago now, 
uh, with Martina Lanton at AU Arts, um, and I began sort of shifting those layers into uh, using things such as um, flashing slip and seeing how uh, the kiln can sort of um, have some agency over what happens on the decoration. So I'm giving away some of that control, which can be really scary, but also very exciting. Um, I continued, let's see here. Um, I continued to use the botanicals, but I actually started integrating uh, things such as uh, quilting panels and patterns that I was using in my quilting practice, which we will come back to. Uh, these are a couple of my favorite cups that I have not been able to let go of. They're still in my kitchen. Uh, what draws me most uh, about this work as a maker um, is that chance to get to share some of the agency over the final work. Um, so I'm giving some of that unpredictability over to the kiln, especially as someone who's new to this process. Um, I can't necessarily say what's going to happen anywhere in the kiln. And so I get to make a certain amount of the decisions that go into the surface uh, and the form. And then I have to sort of revoke that control. And that's been a really um, interesting exercise to, uh, to put myself and my work through. Um, it can be uncomfortable, but it's also really rewarding. Um, one other thing I've been focusing on is pictures. Um, they've been an obsession for over a year now. Um, and this picture on the left, my mom sent me this photo. It's in her bathroom, I think. Um, but it's a picture I made in grade school. So clearly there's, you know, it's been there for a while. Um, and I hope that they've gotten better with some progress. <laughs> Um, pictures fascinate me, I think, because of their sort of dual purpose. Um, they are designed as a vessel to contain, but also as a vessel to deliver. And so they have this sort of role um, um, that has a duality to it that I really find interesting. It's not just to, um, to hold, but to give, right? And that seems really uh, important to me, especially um, when I think about who I am and, and why I'm here, what I'm here to do. Um, this work was fired in a wood soda kiln. Um, it, I think, is my favorite work from this series. Um, and it's jump-started my devotion to atmospheric firing. And so um, now it's sort of a challenge of um, how do I work that into my practice, not having access to that readily. Um, so it's made me uh, really glad that I found the process, but also sad that I've fallen in love with it so hard and have to sort of, um, you know, figure out how to, how to continue. So that's to be continued. Um, this spring, I received a research scholarship from the Illingworth Kerr Gallery um, at AU Arts. And I used the time during lockdown to create these pitcher and basin sets. Um, I was thinking a lot about ritual and the ritual of washing our hands, right? We were all you know, really making sure to wash our hands 80 times a day. Um, and I was thinking about that as a ritual and how I use uh, making as my own ritual, whether it be knitting or um, quilting or potting. I'm, I'm always quite busy. You know, if my hands are idle, my brain sort of goes haywire, um, which I think a lot of people can relate to. Um, this work especially has been uh, a lesson in sort of pulling back from the atmospheric firing and how can I have that same sort of conversation between the making and the maker uh, without needing the atmospheric firing to sort of um, indulge that, uh, I guess, the connection between um, chance and control. Um, in my third year of university, um, I was diagnosed with PCOS, which is polycystic ovarian syndrome. Um, it's a condition that affects about one in 10 women, um, and it affects primarily a woman's hormones. Um, because it affects hormones, it, is, it affects uh, a woman's cycles, uh, as well as her fertility. Uh, so this really um, shook my understanding of what, uh, what I sort of understood to be womanly, um, you know, and, and what it means to be a woman and forced me to really uh, understand for myself whether or not um, being a mother and being a woman, you know, needed to be the same thing or whether they could exist separately uh, and what, you know, exactly did it mean to uh, focus on sort of the fertility or fecundity of my mind rather than that of my body as a vessel. Um, 
Let's see here. Um, so on these plots, I'm using a lot of scientific illustration, again, um, focusing more on sort of the um, chemistry, uh, more so than the botanicals and sort of natural history. Um, it's interesting, I like to tell this story. Um, when I showed this work at school, I had a, a sort of overwhelming number of women come up to me and speak to me about issues regarding their bodies or their cycles or things like that. Um, and someone told me that I had become the patron saint of tampons at uh, AU Arts, which um, I'm not sure how I feel about that title, but it really did sort of open up a lot of conversations. And so now I feel much more comfortable talking about it, but I think there's um, a real thirst for that type of conversation um, around women's health and things like that. Um, let's see. So, um, on a totally different facet of my practice, uh, for a long time it has been quilting. Um, this work is about um, what it means um, to sort of make work uh, within this matrilineal history um, when I don't necessarily, you know, I didn't learn to quilt from a family member, I sort of taught myself. Uh, and maybe that was sort of a yearning to have that matrilineal uh, relationship with more women who are older and wiser. Um, and also to pass that on to future generations, right? Um, another thing that I see in this work um, is sort of this um, push and pull between creating a quilt that, for example, you wouldn't uh, normally wrap around a child or, you know, a newborn. Um, but what does it mean to make quilts for um, babies that I won't necessarily have, right? Um, this is a quilted coat that I made uh, during my time in isolation. Sorry, um, when I think I was really looking for some more color. Um, and so this is kind of a shocking amount of color compared to my other work. Um, however, um, it was centered around this idea of um, quilts as sort of comfort. And how do we, how could I make some sort of object for myself um, that I could like wear out grocery shopping, you know, everyone's wearing masks, everything is sort of new and different, um, but how could I bring that comfort with me and almost wear it as sort of um, armor? Uh, along with that, um, I like the idea of having sort of a one person quilt because this um, idea of quilts is to sort of wrap, you know, over a bed that you share with someone or where people are born or, you know, intimate things happen there with others. Um, and to have this quilt that's so, you know, I, you can only fit one person at a time, sort of um, turn that on to its head. Um, this here is another quilt that I made during school. Um, and on the left is uh, some screen printing that I was doing um, in a class there last year. Um, and so the reason I brought these up is that I can sort of see the layers um, and the transparencies um, in the layers from the pot sort of showing up in my fiber practice, which I think is really exciting to finally see some cohesion there. Uh, what's next? Uh, I'm in a period right now um, at Medelta where I'm focusing on the soda firing because it's um, available and I'm so excited. Um, but in terms of my practice in general, um, I'm working on developing work that holds that same sort of energy and where I'm sharing that agency, maybe not with uh, atmospheric firing, but for example, with a glaze that uh, runs in ways that I can't always predict. Um, and so that's been sort of a challenge of letting go of, of you know, atmospheric firing being my only uh, facet of practice and, and learning how to sort of find what I need out of my work in other avenues, um, but also just calming things down and having a little bit pulling back of the layers. Um, yeah, that's all that I have. Thanks guys. Thank you so much. I'm so glad that you showed some of the quilting too. <laughs> I was like, she's gonna show the quilting stuff, I hope yes. so. Yeah. I think there's such a really beautiful crossover, not just in terms of the imagery um, or the color choices and the patterning and stuff between the two, but even just those ideas of comfort um, and objects that we that are very intimate in our lives, um, a quilts. Uh, is the same as a coffee mug as being like so close to your naked body type of thing right and it's yeah. just and the, those levels of comfort and the time that's invested into making those objects I think is is also tied in with all of that and it's really beautiful mm -hmm. um, 
one question I have for you, um, I mean, the work that you, you were talking about, the work where you bring in your own narratives about your own health issues and stuff. Right. And that's, that's really, it's challenging as artists for us to do that. It takes a lot of vulnerability and courage to do that. And mm -hmm. I always commend artists when they do that. It's, it's not easy. How do you, as an artist, find a way to also protect yourself? Because you've opened yourself up to all these incredible conversations and right. you find then, oh, there's all these women that have these things that they want to talk about too. How do you as an artist protect yourself so that you don't become the therapist or, mm -hmm. you know, someone who, you know, everybody's going to for the answers, right? right? How do you balance that being able to share something so important to you that needs to be out there, but also still having the space for yourself? Mm -hmm. um, I feel like I maybe could answer that question when I'm 60, because I still don't know. <laughs> um, it, you know, I think it's sort of a balance between um, sharing and, and sort of listening because I found that really was important to me when I was sort of going through being diagnosed. Um, and even, even now, I think it's really important to have other women who will listen to me talk about it, right? Um, and just, I think, having that understanding that um, other women are sort of going through similar uh, things um, was really helpful. So I find um, maybe playing the therapist is... Um, not all that uncomfortable for me. I think it's sort of a natural thing to listen, but I think uh, it's been difficult to sort of set that boundary of like, you know, I'm not a doctor. Um, you know, I appreciate you talking to me. Here are some resources, um, you know, and, and really sort of sticking to that emotional side of things and, and not, um, you know, not giving any advice or um, any sort of things like that. So really, I think just setting the boundaries, which is important for me um, anyways, because that's something I struggle with. So. I think as artists, I know for me, it's like often I'm working through, I'm making the work because I have all these questions and I'm trying to find answers. But then when you put it out there, people are like, oh, well, she must have an answer. And you don't yeah. necessarily. It's all part of that beautiful process of, of learning and growing. And yeah. yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, thanks so much for sharing. Thank you. Um, does anybody have any questions for the artists right now? Um, I've seen nothing pop up in the chat, but if not, we, what we might do is bring Noriko back a bit to the foreground. Um, but I actually encourage all of the, of the residents to sort of talk um, and answer questions as well about Medelta itself, um, if we could have a little bit of time. So if anybody has questions about the residency um, and how it's structured, when you need to apply those kinds of things, this is also a really good time for that. Let me find Noriko here again. All of our little head bubbles. Amy's fine too. <laughs> Ooh, that's one of our Medelta staffs on there. Yes. Um, maybe you guys can start by letting us know um, even simple things like how many residents, like we didn't actually get to see all of the residents today that are in the studio. So, how many residents do you have normally throughout the year? Oh, Rob's going to show us everybody else who's <laughs> hiding, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Busted. Uh, we average about 10 um, a month, so those were always changing. We usually have about three year-long artists, uh, and then the rest of them are two, anywhere from one month to eight months, really, I think is what we had. So it's always changing. That's the nice thing about it. Um, we just had one artist leave September and two come in, in the beginning of October. So I feel like with the short-term residencies, the pace, the tension is always high. And that kind of keeps things going for me at least but yeah so we have it's always changing but yeah pretty much around 10 right now with covid we've kind of dropped the number down a little bit but uh but we do have a big space um, yeah we're so lucky in that sense to have the space that we do so social distancing is pretty is pretty easy to do here the one sad thing is no complex lately not too many of those that's the one no, and we all love eating, and everyone is such amazing bakers and cooks here usually. And yeah, that is. Yeah, I feel like it's not mid Delta if I come and there's no pizza party. Like it just wouldn't be right. Yeah. Yes, right. Well, we managed one last week at least, so it's not mm -hmm. impossible, but it's a little different. Yeah. Can you walk us through a little bit about the facilities that you have there? I mean, we know that Lil is there because you've got some, and you actually have amazing new kilns, brand new, new built, newly built atmospheric fire kilns, right? Salt and soda kilns, yeah. Um, I don't know, Amy, do you want to take this or do you want me 
because you're the studio technician or um you want me to just talk a little bit either way yeah salt and soda like uh yeah we're we finished them um we successfully fired the salt kiln a few weeks ago and we have a few bookings for that um there's a few parts like uh for the soda kiln that we're getting remade um but that should probably be up and running i think probably by the end of the month which is really exciting um yeah so we have those here available for artists and residents to use and then also for um just general kiln rental use. So that can be like lo other locals in Medicine Hat or people from out of town as well. Right, and you guys also have, you've got a number of electric kilns. So I'm just mm -hmm. thinking of people when they're applying for a residency, the types of things. You have a Blau? Yep, yes. we have a Blau. Uh, we have front loading um, car uh, gas kiln as well. Um, we have several electric kilns, um, electric test kilns as well. So. I think like facility wise, um, it can get pretty tight here for kiln firing, especially at like the end of the month when everyone's, especially when the flex residents are getting ready to leave. It's like back to back, everyone's unloading, loading immediately after. So it can get, it's exciting. It just gets pretty like, oh, all right, everyone, uh, we've got a schedule and we're going to stick to it as best as we can. Uh, yeah, but I mean, we have like, a wide range of facilities here and equipment for people to use. So I find for the most part, everyone can pretty much get all of their ceramic dreams fulfilled. Is that too big of a statement, maybe? All know. their ceramic dreams fulfilled? That's a pretty big statement. I've got like, some pretty big ceramic dreams. I'm like, actually, maybe, maybe not. But <laughs> they like, we're, we're getting there. We're, we're pretty close, I'd say. So. Yeah, but you guys have a beautiful glazed kitchen as well and a devoted um, plaster area with the plaster laid that's acceptable to all of the residents. And the library that Lael is sitting in right now um, yeah. is, a, is a community library, right? So, um, and is the wood kiln still? Oh, yep. yep. Uh, we had a wood fire actually just uh, two weeks ago that went really well. And yeah, that, that kiln's been here for, that was here before the residency even started, right, Narika? It's like, I think a year before the residency started, so something like 1999. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. yeah, nice. we had a bunch of wood fires here a couple weeks ago. So that was really fun, fun too. So, uh, yeah. and the residency is actually attached to a museum. For anybody who doesn't know that as well, can you mention about the museum? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the museum, um, it's on winter hours right now. So it's a Tuesday through Saturday, 10 to four, but residents have um, access to the museum. So um, yeah, they can go into the museum. It's um, basically self-guided or you can do guided tours there too. Um, the production facility is um, in the museum as well. So they're producing all the wares um, that fills the gift shop using all the historic molds and equipment um, that was used at the Medalta like pottery factory um, back in the day. And um, yeah, residents can go and jigger a bowl there as part of their residency and use the, use the equipment. And JC is working actually in the production um, facility right now. So if JC has anything to add about that, like she has the insider. Well, I will just, um, I'll just add that like the jigger machine is like more than 100 years old and was sold second-handed in 1912 to Midalta. So I feel it's kind of like, it's fun to just try it as a artist and resident too, to just like make a ball or two. And it's just like, I don't know, it's so crazy that you can still use it and it's going well. So yeah. No, it's pretty fun place. We've had a lot of artists who incorporated that into their work as well, where they're here. Um, and we have a lot of molds, um, historical molds as well, that artists have access to. Um, there's all sorts of things. And blanks, also high prop blanks. So a lot of our artists come here and end up doing a completely different project because of what they've seen here on site. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when I was a resident over 10 years ago, because the Highcroft China factory is also just just off site near the Plainsman clay factory. And I know we got to go through that and there's this huge big round tunnel kiln that you can go through and stuff. And there was all of these old molds and I just got to pilfer through those and it was a fabulous experience. And are the, you guys still doing tours as well, the um, IXL brick plant that's on site? Yes. We're sort of booked tours, but yeah, we do do tours of IXL and uh, Highcroft as well. And Plainton also does some tours as well for artists as well. If we book them. Yeah, the history in that space is pretty 
pretty amazing to go through and see the industry that existed there before and and how that's changed and how it impacted you know stuff touring across Canada and stuff and the bricks that were produced and what have you so um, definitely a place for people to go if they're at all interested in ceramics so when should people be applying 15th of April is our main application date so that's for our year-long residency, our flex residency, which is two to six months. Uh, we have our June residency, which is just the month of June. This coming year, it might not happen because all our COVID June artists are, uh, will be there. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's the first one where you could apply for everything. And then we kind of have a secondary application deadline that just passed, that's on September 15th. And those are specifically for flex. And so what happens is a lot of times we get a lot of applications in, we get all the studios filled, and then a lot of people can't make it or whatever. So we do have a secondary one. Um, it's nice for some people too, because they don't necessarily know what they're doing in April about what they're going to do next April. So um, I do recommend everyone try to apply for that first one, April 15th, because that's really where we, we have most applications in. So. And international artists can apply, right? Yes, yeah. The only trick about the international artists is um, we're not an educational institution, so we can't help with getting an, uh, an educational or a student visa. Uh, we can't, unfortunately, hire or sponsor artists to come here. So that's the one trick. You really need to be able to come here on your own, um, on your own dime. But, uh, but we have had a lot of artists um, pretty much from every continent. So, yeah. That's it. Uh, and uh, yeah, we have a lot of Americans coming as well. Not right now, unfortunately, but hopefully starting June, we'll have a lot of other international artists here again. Nice. And in the summer, again, without COVID, you've got classes, week-long classes people can come and do as well. Yeah. So we have uh, summer workshops, um, usually five to 10 day intensive workshops. Uh, you gave one a few years ago. This year was meant to be Robin DuPont, Brendan Tang, and Naomi Clement, who's in Sinian, I think. Um, so hopefully we'll be running those again next year and maybe a few more. Uh, those are great for people who maybe feel like they don't know if they want to come here for a whole month. At least they could experience that this place in five days. And within that workshop, you not only get to work with, uh, with, with the instructor and a group of people, but you could actually get all the tours with in that week um we also have the artist lodge where all our artists can stay if they want now on site so usually you could book a room there um and that has kind of really enhanced everything everyone can share meals as well as the you know the workshops so that's been really successful uh, yeah we were we do occasionally do some sort of weekend workshops as well we had Greg Daly, who was supposed to be here, or who was here, but we weren't able to run the workshop earlier this year. Um, but uh, we're hoping to do a few more of those as well. And talking about doing hopefully some Zoom workshops in the future as well, which might enhance, you know, the experience for our residents here as well as for, for others. Mm -hmm. Fabulous. If anybody else wants to unmute themselves and ask some questions, please feel free to do so. Kevin Morris just said, you should put all your ceramic dreams fulfilled on a t-shirt. Looking forward to visiting next summer, hopefully. Thanks to Lil and all the other speakers again. I second that motion, Kevin. I want that on a t-shirt. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. I have a, a t-shirt um, from the last residency I did in Toronto that all my studio mates made for me and it's in that gothic font and it says it's like a neon green shirt and it says studio dad on it and I should have worn that shirt today <laughs> that's the closest I have to like this like ceramic nerdy kind of shirt I'm very proud of it though I think I was I was studio dad there I regret nothing <laughs> that's awesome yeah. 
All right. Well, if there's nothing else, I want to thank you all for joining us today. Um, thank you to everybody that spoke today. It's very much appreciated. Um, thanks to Clay Week for having this event so that we can all be a part of it and to make and do for um, bringing the Canadian content to Clay Week. Um, and to everybody who came to participate as well, um, really thank you so much for your donations. Um, all of those donations help us support artists. So um, it all goes to a good cause. So that was much appreciated as well so thank you very much and so we'll probably get this up on the make and do youtube channel in the next little while so you can please feel free to share it with other people and stuff as well if you enjoyed it thanks Carol. thank you so much thank you. Yeah. awesome so nice to Bye. see you all <laughs> yeah. take care everyone bye, bye everyone thanks bye. girl see you bye. downstairs <laughs> <laughs> see you downstairs